The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has been dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And he walked by the sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father with their they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the one God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So I think one of the one of the first questions that it's always good to ask about a passage of scripture is who is it that this story is about? You know, wh- where is the spotlight shining in this story? Now, for today's gospel reading, it, you know, it would seem, perhaps most often we would approach it as a story about Peter and Andrew and James and John. I mean, we name churches after these guys, so it's probably, they're, they're probably important characters, right? It, it is their action that gives the story its drama. I mean, they're, they're out there, fishermen out fishing, spending the day trying to provide for their families and and make ends meet in a system that is wired against them, actually. Um, the, the scholars will tell you they're not out there as small businessmen, but as as contract agents working for the Romans, assigned, you know, a quota of fish to provide for the authorities. Anyway, th- these guys are out there minding their own business, trying to feed their families and keep the Romans off their backs. When Jesus shows up and calls them to join him. And, and they respond right then and there. So isn't this story about them? You, you would think so, and in a sense, of course, it is. But, but instead, I think it's really more a story about the new king in town. This, this new emperor, actually, representing a higher authority in this outpost of the Roman Empire. Even though Jesus really doesn't do all that much in this story, it's really all about him. And I think we get a hint of that from the quotation from the book of Isaiah that Matthew drops into his story. Now, why does he do that? I mean, it just sounds like an interruption to me. Um, but, but it matters a lot, actually, to Matthew that Jesus is fulfilling the prophecies and the hopes of the Jewish people. So in his gospel, Matthew does this 14 times, pointing out something that Jesus does to show God making good on the covenant to deliver and restore Israel. So here, Matthew reminds the, the Jewish people hearing his story that that God has promised to bring light and hope to people sitting in darkness in this area where Jesus is now making his home, Capernaum by the Sea of Galilee. So the reason that's there is that back in Isaiah's day, 700 years earlier, another foreign power, the Assyrians, had conquered the Jewish people in that area and, and set up their empire. But God promised at that point through Isaiah, as we heard in the first reading, um, that God would actually make that land glorious and do that by bringing to the throne a king who would rule with the goodness and justice and and even the geographic scope of King David. Somebody who would reestablish God's dominion in Galilee of the Gentiles. 
Well, with Jesus then moving into the area, and that area now occupied by the Romans, Matthew sees God's ancient purposes being realized 700 years down the road. Jesus is making good on God's promise that, that the kingdom would return there, bringing light and life, actually not just to the Jewish residents, but to all the people living there under foreign oppression. And, and so when God's kingdom comes among them, the people in Galilee will see divine light dawning in this region and shadow of death. That's Isaiah's promise. Well, well, then, Matthew continues, the story continues, Jesus starts to proclaim what God has sent him to proclaim, which is that the kingdom of heaven has come near. And in fact, the kingdom of heaven has come near in him. Now, of course, Matthew knows and we know that this won't be the kind of a kingdom that Israel used to know, you know, one with a human king sitting on a throne and ruling as God's viceroy on earth. Instead of being a geographic kingdom, this kingdom of heaven that Jesus proclaims is a state of being. The, the, the reign and rule of God revealing itself to be so much more powerful even than the reign and rule of Caesar and all his armies. So Jesus may not be the kind of king they were expecting. I mean, just the opposite, in fact. He's, he's, he's a king who has come from the bottom rung of society and who hangs out with the folks the, the powerful people would rather ignore. But by quoting that passage from Isaiah, Matthew is signaling that, that Jesus is God's true king anyway, that the, that the prophecy is indeed being fulfilled God's just doing it, establishing the kingdom of heaven in this really surprising way. Okay, so with that background, Jesus then comes on the scene and comes to the Sea of Galilee and, and encounters these fishermen. <laughs> and their response to him, I don't know about you, but their response to him has always seemed very odd to me. Almost like they're zombies or something. I mean... C could you imagine just dropping everything, even literally dropping the tools of your trade and following someone who comes and calls you? I mean, it'd be like taking your laptop and tossing it to the side and wandering down the street after this itinerant preacher. Now, on the other hand, sort of, it, it's not like they were leaving a lucrative, well-respected profession. I mean, fishermen were pretty much despised in their society, one, one commentator says. And honestly, they were lucky to eke out a living after turning over much of their catch to the Romans. But, but still, it, it's weird. Jesus comes to Peter and Andrew and says, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And they do it. And then for James and John, <clears throat> it's even harder to believe. I mean, they're, they're out there working with their father, Zebedee. And the minute Jesus calls them away from the boat, Zebedee has lost his workforce and his retirement plan. I mean, they're gone. And so, so much for honoring your father, as the fifth commandment would tell us to. Plus, to make the situation just that much harder to understand... Jesus hasn't really done anything yet terribly impressive. I mean, he hasn't healed anybody or cast out any demons. So it's not like these fishermen were wowed by his miracles. <laughs> but clearly they were wowed by something. And I think it goes back to what Matthew's telling us in that reference to Israel's ideal king. Jesus is out there proclaiming the reign and rule of God has come among them. And in fact, that they are standing in the midst of it because he's God's ideal king. The one promised to come from the house and lineage of David, as Luke says. And it turns out then that these nobodies there in the fishing boat are indeed somebodies after all, despite how the world sees them. Because if, if Jesus is God's ideal king, these four obedient fishermen are the king's ideal subjects. I mean, they know a divine command when they hear it. 
So, so maybe it's worth asking this question about this reading. Who's choosing whom? I mean, in our society, we're, we're used to all the choices lying with us. We live in a society where the rugged individual reigns supreme, right? But much of the energy and commerce of our culture centers on persuading millions of rugged individuals to make particular choices. Choices that will determine whether businesses or political parties or churches will continue as going concerns. People have to show up, you know. But everywhere we look, someone or something is asking us to choose this rather than that. Recognizing that in a market economy, you know, the power rests with each of us to make those choices. So one reason we may have trouble understanding these disciples is that their world is upside down. Or ours is, depending on how you want to look at it. I mean, in, in the world of Matthew's gospel, Peter and Andrew and James and John are, are individuals to the extent we know their names, but we know nothing about them other than their despised profession and their social class. The story doesn't say anything about their motivations. What led them to choose Jesus over fishing? Why was he persuasive? Was his deal the best deal? I mean, the story is not concerned with any of that. Instead, the story starts from the opposite point of view. It's not about these fishermen and their power to choose. It's about Jesus and his authority to call. I mean, the king has come, announcing his reign as God's viceroy on earth. And the king has chosen the four of them. I mean, they're, they're, they're soldiers deployed on a mission. And, and, and if they did have something to say that this story omits, it was probably just, you know, sir, yes, sir. So, so for us, the, I think the question is not so much, what would have made me leave my business and follow Jesus? Instead, the question is, how am I going to respond to the reality, breaking into my everyday existence, that God is the one truly ruling and reigning over my world? I mean, if that's true, and, and we proclaim that we think it's true every time we say the Lord's Prayer, if, if, if it's true that we're asking for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, what does that mean for my life? When the king walks through your workplace or your living room, or when the king pops up on your social media feed alongside the culture's other influencers and calls you to follow him, what will you do? So like Peter and Andrew and James and John, you know, we, we can't say what that moment of calling from God is going to look like. But we can say to whom the call is going to come. Because the reign and rule of God looks like this. One nobody after another saying yes to the call to share divine love with other nobodies. <laughs> Focusing not on the Romans dominating our governance or the self-interested religious leaders telling us how to live, but instead focusing on the king as he walks by and calls us to put down those nets of our own making and empowers us to come along and fish for people right beside him. <laughs>